Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Kimberly Ann. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. Oh, my God. I'm going to cry, and I haven't even gotten started yet. Wow. My sponsor is Claire. My home group is the South Philadelphia Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My sobriety date is January 23rd, 1994. And through the grace of Almighty God, my higher power, I have not found an excuse necessary to pick up a drink, a drug, or any mind or mood-altering chemical since that time. That is a bona fide miracle. I'm sure that everybody feels like in this room that they know the hand of God has moved in their life. I'm telling you, I can never, the way I feel about that, I can never give back to Alcoholics Anonymous and the God of my understanding that which he has given to me. I am grateful to be alive. I am grateful to be sober. I am floored to call myself recovered. I met, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting a young man um, and talking to him on, on a couple occasions. And we talked about the idea of being recovered. And I always say I'm recovered. And I absolutely know that of myself I am nothing. The Father doeth the works. And I want to make abundantly clear in this room tonight that I am under no illusion that I am drunk proof. I certainly know that alcohol is a subtle foe. And if I do not trust God and clean house and keep my side of the street clean and remain in fit spiritual condition, alcohol will grab me by the throat and it will drag me through my own life like it did before I was brought to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can't even credit myself with getting here. I'm under no illusion about that either. So I want to say to you that before I even meet you, for those of you I know in this room, thank you. Thank you, Scott, for asking me to be in service. Thank you, Dave, for asking me to be in service. Thank you, Dawn, for introducing me in, in a way that, that just reminds me of how grateful I need to be for a spiritual program of action that kind of spelled out the principles that I am, without a doubt, trying every day to practice in all of my affairs Thanks, Kath, for being a part of reading for me. I got here tonight and I was thinking, wow, how did I wind up here? Actually, that started for me when I got in the car today. I was leaving work. I got picked up by my boyfriend, who I love with all my heart, and people know it. I'm not ashamed to say it. And, uh, and I got picked up by him, and I told him, and I'm not going to lie. I said, I don't know what it is today. I'm afraid. I'm nervous. I'm excited. I'm grateful. I'm honored. I'm all those things all at once today. And I started to tell him what he already knows because he has his own experience, strength, and hope. That I felt like a nothing. And I felt like a nobody. And I felt broken beyond repair, although I lay in a fetal position on more than one occasion, asking God to help me, like, please help me, please fix this, whatever this is, fix it. And the fact 
that I have trudged this road to this happy destiny where I stand right now. And I make no bones about it. I know it's going to get greater later. I know it's going to get greater later. And I'm looking forward to it today. And me and my good friend Kathy were talking about it over dinner. Every ounce of pain that I have experienced since I have been graced with day one of sobriety, I have learned to embrace and ride with and ring on through that emotional ringer that they talk about because I know on the other side of that, I know there is spiritual growth beyond my wildest imagination and a change that I could have never done by myself. Never done by myself. And, uh, but I was telling them, like, I can't believe it. The fact that people invite me anywhere, that anybody <laughs> would want to be in my company, yet think that I have something that might be of value to another human being blows me away. And I want to tell you, as I share my experience, strength, and hope, I know that my God will not be outdone. He will not be outdone. So I know it's coming, and I know it's going to get bigger, and I know it's going to get better, and I know it's going to get brighter, and I'm not talking about external means to solve this internal condition. I'm talking about I've gone from rags to riches on the inside. On the inside. How it works says that I need to share with you what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now. I better take off my glasses. This is going to get messy. <laughs> oh. From as far back as I can remember. And I kid you not. I knew I was good in my heart. I knew I wanted to be good in my soul. I knew that I wanted to connect with you. I knew that I just wanted God's light to shine right through me. But I was suffering from a spiritual malady from the time I was five and six and seven years old, and I was so blocked off, I couldn't make it happen. I was afraid of you. I was so afraid. I was afraid you wouldn't like me. I was afraid that you wouldn't want to know me. I was afraid you wouldn't let me play with you. I was just so afraid of everything and everybody. I was too young to comprehend all of the bedevilments that are found in our big book. I would grow into them, but I tell you, I knew I was chronically unhappy. And I was so wracked with emotional pain and anxiety that from the time I was five or six or seven, I didn't want to be here. And I would talk to this God that I knew before I even was introduced to him in Catholic school. I would say, God, I know you don't want me to feel like this. Can't you help me? I know you don't want me to think all these terrible things about myself. Can't you fix that? Can't you take it away? seemed like it never went anywhere. And I tried to make it every day in pain and in fear. I don't want to tell my mom and dad's story here. It's not their story, it's my story. 
But it's pertinent information that kind of gives you the backdrop of where I come from. My father was alcoholic. He is alcoholic. I can say that. I know the literature says that we are not supposed to call anybody else or term anybody else alcoholic. My father calls himself alcoholic. He's in recovery two years greater than myself. My mother really looked like one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so from the time I was little, there was booze around my house. My father and his brothers, they drank, they got drunk, they blacked out, they passed out, they came to. And sometimes in between, my father beat the living tar out of my mother so bad that she was unrecognizable. I love my father, and I'm so grateful for the ninth step because he has made amends. But I was so terrified in my own home. And they did the best they could with what they had, but what they had just wasn't enough. And I couldn't get what I needed there from them. It's not their fault. I don't blame them. Um, so I would be afraid every day. And we lived in South Philly, born and raised there. And uh, I would have to get my play clothes on and go out to Front and Mercy on my block, five, six, seven years old. And I would have to try to make friends with people. And I thought I was too ugly, and I thought I was too skinny, and I thought my clothes weren't good enough, and I thought you knew everything about what was going on in my house, so I was full of shame and fear and guilt and sadness. And, uh, and I didn't know how to approach you. I didn't know how to make friends with you. I didn't know how to do it. So as rigorously honest as I can be here today, I dishonored people before I even got a chance to know them. I was dishonest with them. I didn't give them an opportunity to make a decision for themselves whether or not they would like me, whether or not they would think I was friendly, or whether or not they would think that I was a worthwhile person to get to know. I didn't go through any of that. I skipped right over to what our big book talks about like right before a third step, you know what I mean? And uh, it talks about the actor who wants to run the whole show, who's forever trying to arrange the lights and the scenery and all the players. And I was doing that before I was even aware of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like I had no idea. Oh, I knew I was doing it, but I had no idea it was, in, it was, it was an external means to solve this internal condition. So I met people and I said, hi, how you doing? You have a really pretty smile. Can I play? I have some candy. Do you want my candy? You want to come eat at my house for dinner? Like I was so afraid that if I didn't somehow purchase your friendship, that it was never going to happen. And I operated like that outside of 141 Mercy Street, and I did that at Our Lady of Mount Carmel School, and I did that at St. Casimir's when we moved, and I did that at Sacred Heart. Like, we had a crazy life, you know what I mean? And uh, my family moved from, from Front and Mercy when I was probably about seven or eight years old. My father got hurt down the Long Shore. And I got to tell you, like... Um, I had it down to a science. I knew who to let go first in the game. And I knew who to let pick the game. And I knew who to let win the game. And I knew who to give that candy to. And I knew who to invite for dinner. And I knew who to compliment first. Like, I had it down. And I was, like, doing it with ease or so I thought. Like, I was uncomfortable, but I was like, oh, here comes so-and-so. Now, in my bag of tricks... And I would go out there, and I would give that compliment, and you would smile, and I would smile, and I would go, Phew, everything's going to be okay. 
So my father got hurt. He was a longshoreman. He worked down a down a docks on loading ships, and uh, he got work, hurt one day on a job, and uh, he needed surgery after surgery, and he could no longer work down there, and and they had to buy him out. So he was in his 20s, and they had to buy him out the retirement age. So in the 70s and 80s, that was like a chunk of money. It was a pretty good chunk of money, and uh, and my mom was at home with three of us. I have an older sister, Dawn, and a younger sister, Kara. There's six of us now, but there was three of us then. And my mom was at home with us, and she was thinking, this is our chance. This is it. We're going to move out of this neighborhood. And I'm sure she bore her own shame and uh, for what was going on. And we're going to move somewhere else. And we're going to get a nice house with a little picket fence and a nice yard And everybody's going to have their own bedroom. And we're going to have a little slice of middle class living. And everything is going to be okay. And I know she took, she took her shopping for houses. Like we were looking at houses in Roxborough and in Jersey and in all these little places that were right outside the city and, uh, and sometimes my dad was in tow and sometimes he wasn't. I remember my grandmother's logic, telling my mother, it's my father's mother, telling my mother, you guys can't move out of the city. You can't go far away. How's Chrissy going to get home when he's drunk? So just so that he didn't have to drink and drive very far, we didn't move. We moved, but we didn't move like my mom wanted to move. We moved like my dad wanted to move. And they, they, uh, they invested in a business. And it was an alcohol extreme. They bought a bar. <laughs> right. Exactly. And they moved us. So we lived down one end in Whitman, the community of Whitman, and we moved up another end, and I think that was Pennsport. Um, and, uh, and they moved us on top of the bar. So it's three kids and my mom and my dad and, uh, and a three story building and the top two floors of living environment. And the bottom floor is where every sinful thing on this earth that you could think of happening was taking place. Um, so I'll tell you what it was like there. They... <laughs> Because I know. Um, so they had, they had um, a dartboard and a shuffleboard table and a pool table and all-night card games and a dart league and a shuffleboard league and a softball team and a jukebox. And um, they were taking action and watching the races and taking numbers and gambling all night long and go go girls and everything people were getting loaded on non AA conference approved materials in the bathroom <laughs> like anything that you could think of going on was going on at Pax Point I'm talking everything like I'm not proud of this today I'm like oh my god I don't know how none of us died like, it was crazy. I don't know how somebody didn't kill my father. I don't know how he didn't drink himself to death. I don't know how somebody did, he didn't kill somebody else. Like, like the grace of Almighty God is, is uh, it's incredible to me. And uh, the way he's moving in my family is indeed miraculous. And uh, I wouldn't have it any other way today. Um, so I just want to say, like, so I'm this little girl, right? So I'm like seven or eight. I got it all figured out at 141 Mercy Street, and I find out that my dad cannot get annihilated and drive his car really far distances, so we're going to move. But we're going to move on top of this bar. And uh, I'm terrified. Selfishness and self-centeredness in the extreme. I'm not terrified that I'm moving with my mom and dad. 
I was terrified of my father, make no bones about it. I was like a bedwetter until I was in my teens. Like I was scared to death of him. When he came in drunk and everything was black and rageful in my house, like I didn't want to move. And I wasn't going to move. Um, Like I got to tell you, like I wasn't, but that wasn't really what had me. What really had me was I knew I needed to make new friends. And I knew I needed to go to a new school. And I knew I needed to live in a new neighborhood. And I didn't think I was going to make it. So seven or eight years old, once again, I was crippled by fear. And I, and, and, and I, you know, I love the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm a big book thumper, and I'm a fan of the 12 and 12, and I think the literature is so important. It has, it's a textbook that is meant to be studied and and by taking the clear cut precise direction in there my life i've been i've been my life's been revolutionized like i can't even i can't even tell you like rocket it is is an understatement but, but there's a part of the big book that talks about you know not fully having this the fear problem solved you know confidence is good as far as it goes but it doesn't fully solve the fear problem. And I had the confidence that I knew who to let go first and who to let pick the game and who to let win the game and who to give my candy to and who to invite over. Like, like I had that confidence. It didn't fully solve the fear problem, but guess what? All that confidence was wiped out when I knew I was going to move, when I knew I had to move and I had to start all over. And this was a little bit of a rougher territory than I was used to. The kids around there were a little bit older, the families were a little bit rougher, a little bit rougher, and, uh, and, and the bar got raised. The expectation got higher. And I was afraid. I was timid. I was skinny. I was little. I was frizzy hair and crooked teeth and awkward socially. And I didn't think I was going to make it. Like, I, I kid you not, I thought I was chum in the water. I'm like, what am I going to do? I spent a lot of Friday nights and Saturday nights alone at home in the house, not playing with other kids because I couldn't meet them. I was too scared. I was scared of them and I was scared of how to approach them. Like I really didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to make it happen. And I would talk to God and I would sit on the back room steps of my mom and dad's bar outside on the side steps. And once again, I'd say, God, I know you don't want me to feel like this. Please help me. God, I know you don't want me to think like this. Please help me. Like, and, and, and there was this other thing I did and it, uh, man, I keep pausing because I want to cry. I would sit on a Friday or Saturday night at the top of the steps leading down into the bar. It was like an open, floating staircase. And on a Friday night and a Saturday night, I would sit there, and I would watch, crouch down, knees up, and I would peek. I was peeking. And I would see all these people. And I'm talking, it would be two or three deep on the right, two or three deep on the left, two or three deep in the front. And the jukebox was blaring and the alcohol was flowing and people had bright eyes they were sparkling rosy cheeks they were laughing they were laughing belly laughs and everything was moving for me like slow motion it was like something out of a movie the smoke was looming And they had a drink in this hand and a cigarette in this hand and they were taking a sip and they were finishing their conversation and they were taking a drag and they were listening and they were laughing a belly laugh that I had never seen or experienced in my six or seven or eight years of my life. I was crippled. I was unhappy chronically and I looked at these people and I thought 
I want what they have. I need what they have. And I cannot wait to get it. So I had my first drink when I was about eight or nine years old deliberately. That was not my first introduction to alcohol. My father is a recovered alcoholic himself. His brothers uh, drank um, problematically. And um, alcohol was always in my house, like I said. So it was always fun to give the kids a drink or to sit on my uncle's lap and sip his beer, and eat a cheesesteak with them, you know, and, and so I knew I had drank beer before. I had brandy on my gums, you know, that was my grandmother, give her a little brandy, you know, like, like all that stuff. But when I tell you, I made a conscious decision at eight or nine years old, watching those people in the bar, to drink deliberately and for the effect produced by alcohol because I saw what it was doing for them and I was desperate and I had a sickness so deep down in my soul unbeknownst to me that only an act of providence was going to take it from me so I was going to settle for the booze (laughs) what would happen on a Saturday night is my mom and dad would drink They would party. They would get drunk. They would shut the bar at 2 o'clock in the morning. They would drink till 3 o'clock in the morning as they cleaned up. Then they would go out with their friends, and they would drink until the sun came up at all of the after-hours clubs. And then they would come home when the sun was up on a Sunday morning, and they would sleep in a coma like the dead for hours and so Sunday morning I had decided was my ticket and I would go down on a Sunday morning and I would turn the jukebox on and I had studied this place so well that I would go behind it and jack up the credits I'd like to say it was alcohol that made me dishonest, but that would be a lie. (laughs) So I would jack up the credits, and I would turn it up just a little bit so I could hear it if I was sitting at that end of the bar. Then I would pick all my favorite songs. And then I would go behind the bar, and I would open up my mom and dad's quarter box. And I would take out a roll of quarters, And I would crack it on the end of the bar. And I would listen to see if anybody moved upstairs. And when they didn't, I would walk over to the cigarette machine. And I would drop the quarters in. They were not like the cigarette machine of years ago. Actually, they're not like the present day cigarette machines. Like I think about it now and I think they're like quiet, electronic Sip, sip. They take your dollar. Back then, quarters weighed a little more. And I would walk to this old, gigantic, clunky cigarette machine. And I would drop a quarter in. And it would go clunk, 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 all the way to the bottom. I would be like, oh my God. And I would listen. I had to do that four times. <laughs> It was scary. But now I'm aging myself because, sorry for all you smokers, yes, cigarettes were a dollar in the machine back then. And I did that four times, right? And I would drop the the quarter, and then I would would take the handle, and I would walk it out. (laughs) Then I'd walk it back in. Because you know what it did would be like, clank, 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 cha-ching, ba-bang, pop. Like somebody was going to move. Somebody was going to get up. And then I would be discovered. I would be found out, and it would be over for me. 
And I am telling you that I knew that that booze was a magical elixir and I needed to get it. Whatever was in that cigarette and whatever was in that glass, I needed to get my hands on it because I needed the solution. I am not an alcoholic who drank because I like the taste of alcohol. And I am not an alcoholic who ever had fun drinking. I hear lots of wonderful, funny, humorous stories in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not mine. I drank for the effect produced by alcohol from day one. And I poured the booze in a glass. And I will not exaggerate or pontificate like the bottom line is I was drinking melon liqueur sweet vermouth grenadine like any sweet liquor like I was a kid so I was going and I was flipping the bottle up and I was tasting it and I'd be like oh and I would put it down and I would take another one and I would go "Mm, okay that's good (laughs) then I would pour it at a rocks glass I would get a rocks glass and I would fill it I would fill the rocks glass and I would go sit at the end of the bar with my back to the jukebox on a bar stool. And I would take that cigarette out and I would light it. I would puff it. I didn't know how to inhale. I would puff that cigarette and I would drink that drink. And I am telling you that when that alcohol washed over my brain and through my body, It was like electricity. I was on fire on the inside. And I had arrived. And I was no more than eight or nine years old. And I had arrived. And I would smoke that cigarette. And I would drink that alcohol. And the buzz would come over me. And I would start to smile. And then it was confirmed for me. I knew this was the answer. I knew this was it. And then I would swing around on the bar stool (laughs) because I was like eight or nine and I didn't know what else to do. And I was like elated and I was excited and I was by myself drinking and smoking cigarettes. And, uh, And I'm telling you, I forged a relationship with alcohol at that very moment. And you are going to have to pry it from my dead cold hands that was that was it for me it was a magical elixir I was an alcoholic of a seemingly hopeless variety from the gate from the word go me and my good friend Chris were talking about trudging that's my topic tonight trudging the road to a happy destiny. It just dawned on me just this very moment that I have been trudging this road to a happy destiny since I was five and six and seven years old because I knew God and I talked to God and I asked Him for help. My problem was not a relationship with a higher power, so to speak. I had one. I got the tar kicked out of me in Catholic school for my relationship with God. Now, I know that sounds ironic, but when I would be acting out on my character flaws in school, the nun would, like, holler at me. And she would scream at me, and she'd say, You're incorrigible, young lady! And I would just look at her quizzically. She'd say, you're going to hell. And I'd say, no, I'm not. God loves me. And she would like smack. Like they were, not, they were very liberal with the beatings in Catholic school. <laughs> they had them to spare. And uh, don't you sass me. I, was, I didn't even know what sass meant. I was like, what does she mean? But I... But like I knew, like I was not confused about God 
or the existence of God. I didn't know how to rightly relate myself to a higher power. So I didn't know how to conform my will to his will so he could take me where he had me to go. Like, I didn't know about that. So I was just drinking every Sunday I could and smoking cigarettes every Sunday I could and hoping that my parents didn't get up. And I was slowly, you know, the definition, we looked it up, to trudge, to walk slowly with heavy steps, laboriously, due to exhaustion. Man, I was exhausted. And I was nine, and I was ten, and I was eleven, and I was already tired, and I was already wishing God didn't wake me up. I am not somebody who ever actively tried to commit suicide. And I know that is in our literature that some people make the supreme sacrifice rather than, you know, fight. Um, and I know that some people have failed attempts at that. That's not my story. But what is my story is from as far back as I could remember, I would say, God, I can't do this another day. Like, why are you waking me up? Please. I just wanted it to be over. And I was too young. It hadn't even begun yet. Or it had just begun and I didn't know it. And uh, so I have trudged before Alcoholics Anonymous. And I have trudged in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I love that section of the big book where it says, like, you can have this. All it takes is willingness, patience, and labor. And my home group, the South Philadelphia group of Alcoholics Anonymous, my good friend Paulie would always say, you'll get nothing for nothing in AA, and you'll get less for two cents. So if half measures avail you nothing, take heed to that warning. Like, he was honest. They didn't lie to me down there. You know what I mean? They gave me a hug when I needed one. They gave me a swift kick when I needed one. Like I learned, I trudged this road and continue to trudge in many areas of my life laboriously, but I am willing. I am willing. I'm not, I've never given up. I'm never giving this back. I could say never. I know I got to work within this day. But I'm telling you, you're going to have to pry this sobriety, this love of God, this love of AA and the beautiful people I meet. You're going to have to pry that from my dead cold hands too. You're not getting it. (laughs) You're not. It is mine. You can have it though because you're backed by a power too. You're backed by a power. He's limitless. Limitless. I don't call if you call, I don't care if you call him Allah or Buddha or Jesus Christ or spirit of the universe or force of nature or creative intelligence. I don't, that doesn't matter to me. That's between you and him. That's a personal decision. But you have just scratched the surface of a limitless load that's going to pay dividends. And I know I have. I know as long as I continue to mine it for the rest of my life and insist on giving the entire product away. So when my friend asked me to be in service here, I was blown away, but I said yes. Because whoever might feel a little bit of hope through any trudging that I've had to do and think, yeah, that's me. Yeah, and I want this thing. Like I'm happy to lay this kid at your feet. I'm happy. I I want you to embrace life. I want you to have a life beyond your wildest dreams. I want to continue to grow along spiritual lines. I picked up that drink at eight or nine. And like I said, alcohol grabbed me by the throat. And it took me through the next 13, 14 years of my life. And it got progressively worse. So by the time I was 10, I was stealing quarts of beer from my mom and dad's beer box. And I was sneaking out to the parks and to the schoolyards. 
And by the time I was 12 and 13, I was cutting or hooking in school, however you might say it, in my Catholic school uniform. By that time, 40 answers had come around. And I would be in the park around the corner from my house, up the street from my house, actually, at that point, until we moved again, but up the street from my house, in a Catholic school uniform, unzipped, drop down, white school blouse, tie undone, shirt unbuttoned, and a 40-ounce of bud <laughs> at 11 o'clock in the morning, right? I didn't drink like a lady. I didn't act like a lady. And I wasn't treated like a lady. And I'm okay with telling you that. You can take my fifth step and you can stick it on a billboard on I-95. I'm free. I don't care. I know who I am and I know whose I am. And I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I am a woman of dignity and grace. And I walk humbled under the grace of Almighty God. And all I want to do is serve Him and serve you. So I'm not afraid anymore what other people are going to think about me. I'm not bogged down by that. I'm not blocked off by that. It was not like that for some time. By the time I was 15, I had my first alcohol overdose. Obviously, I had my first. It wasn't my last. It was grain alcohol, and I drank myself to near death and a coma. And I was hospitalized and tubes down my throat. And, uh, it was ugly. So I'm cutting school. I'm overdosing on grain alcohol. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hanging with people that were a little older than me, thereby they were a little more advanced than me, and I started to try to use some methods to control my drinking. So if I wanted to drink more, I might have did this. If I wanted to not be dangerously and disgustingly antisocial, I would take a couple of those before I drank that. Like, I was just, you know, trying the methods. Um, I was an unwelcome hanger on. 15, 16, 17, everywhere I went. I was not a daughter to my family, my parents. I was not a good granddaughter. I was a terrible sibling, a horrible role model. I was not a good friend. I was certainly not a good student. Alcohol told me it was okay to quit school at 15. And I was trapped in a delusion. And I thought I was going to be an entrepreneur in the business of sales. <laughs> right. I was like a nothing and a nobody and making money for someone else. But I was too dumb to realize it. Too egotistical with zero self-esteem. What an, I was like a walking oxymoron. It's crazy. But let me tell you that I drank and I got drunk and I blacked out. And I came to, and that is how I lived from 16 and 17 and 18 and 19. And I started to work in bars, and I would hang from corner to corner to corner to corner, and, and, and I would try to adapt to my environment. So if I was going down to somebody's corner that they were a little bit more like jocks, you would see me in a little bit more of a preppy outfit even though I hated it. And then if I was hanging with the guys from the neighborhood, you would see me in high-top sneakers and basketball shorts or cut-off dungarees, drinking, you know, drinking quarts and hanging in shorts outside the bar. Like, like I was just a... I was so, such a disappointment. My life was going nowhere, and it was going nowhere fast. And I was a dropout. And I got this crazy, grand idea that I can't go anywhere unless I really have an, e an education. So when I was 18 and still drinking and still getting drunk and still blacking out and still coming to, um, I decided I was going to get a GED. And I'm not really 
Hmm. I'm pretty bright. I'll say that. Uh, and I, and I say that in all humility. Like, I don't know a lot of things about a lot of things. And I'm okay with that because I'm open to learning about that which I don't know. But I managed with a 15 year old, ninth grade, 10th grade, can't get out of 10th grade education to just go and take a GED test, two on one night, two on the next night, one on the next night, out the door with a GED and enroll myself in Community College of Philadelphia because I thought that's the answer. See, if I just had the right education, I would meet the right people. And if I just met the right people, I would have the right situation, the right job. If I just got the right job and the right group of friends, I'll meet the right guy. And if I just got the right guy... I'm going to ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. I can work if I want to work. If I don't want to work, I'll stay home. We'll have a nice house. We'll have a white picket fence. Maybe we'll have kids. I didn't really want them, but if you wanted me to and you were willing to marry me, I was going to tell you whatever you wanted to hear. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I was not good. I'm just going to be honest. There's a lot of women in this room, and I thank you. Women go down harder and faster from alcohol. That's in our literature. And I engaged in pitiful and incomprehensible demoralizing experiences. I degraded myself and I allowed other people to degrade me. And whoever you wanted me to be and whatever you wanted me to be, I wanted to be that so bad because I thought I needed you. I thought you were going to fix me. And, and you know, I always had a just-in-case guy, too. <laughs> always. Because I drank, I got drunk, I blacked out, I passed out, I degraded myself, I allowed people to degrade me. I was not girlfriend material. I get that. Like, <laughs> I get it. So I had to have the just-in-case guy, because just in case this don't work out, I got to have a backup plan. It was just painful. It was excruciating. I was ashamed of myself. I couldn't stop. My character flaws and my makeup, my defects, my sins, whatever you want to call them, they were there. They were like a cancer eating away at the inside of my spirit, my soul. And when I added alcohol to them, it was like trying to put out a fire with kerosene. <laughs> like I was a mess. People started to say things to me like, are you going to behave tonight? <laughs> We're not going to help. Kim, I can't let you in. One guy even said to me, it's too painful to love you. You got to go. And he had every right to do that. And probably should have done it a long time before that. And I didn't mean to be that way. And I didn't want to be that way. And I was so powerless and so unmanageable and hated myself to the core. I moved. I moved to Jersey thinking I was going to do a great geographical change, thinking I was going to just be able to go to a new place with new people, start all over, I was caught in the grips of a fatal progression that was so powerful. I had no will to resist its demands. And I would cry. And I would beg God. And I thought it was never going to end. But over in Jersey in January of 1994... I got rescued.
I got rescued from pain and misery and shame and guilt and remorse and fear and racking anxiety and brokenness. I got rescued. And it was a day like any other day. And my day looked like this. I got up. I went to work by 8 o'clock in the morning. I worked at a bar, Johnny Gibbons, in Atlantic City. And I drank through my shift. And then I got on the other side of the bar. And I drank after my shift. And bars down there are open 24 hours. So I drank until I didn't even know where I was or what I was doing. And then somehow or another, I would make it home. Not always by myself. (laughs) And the last night of my drinking, I was with my just-in-case guy. And I said to him, what am I to you? And I wanted him to say, you're beautiful, and you're special, and you're valuable, and you're worthwhile, and I love you, and I want to be with you. If I could have just heard that, I thought, maybe I won't wish for death tonight. He didn't say that. And so he left. And I drank the booze that I had in my hands. And I curled up in the bowl in a fetal position beside my bed. And I cried out to God like I had never cried out to God before. And my prayer was just a little bit different this time. I had always asked God to do for me. This time I told God, I can't take it. I can't live this life anymore. I don't want you to wake me up anymore. And then I asked him, what will you have me do? And two days later, he dropped me off at the South Philadelphia group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was January 23rd, 1994, and I have never left. And I have hung in there, like most of you, shaking and rattling and rolling and feeling uncomfortable in my own skin and hating myself and having self-pity ooze from every pore and never feeling like, never feeling like it was, I was going to amount to anything, like anything would be, which I knew, I want to tell you, I knew from the very first meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous, I may, make no mistake about it, as my, as my God is my witness, and anybody who really knows me knows I, w- I just love the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart and soul. I literally knew that he brought me there. <laughs> I one, two, and three washed over me like a flood, like I knew it from the first meeting, and I was crying because I had never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous before in my life. I went to that meeting because I wanted to ask my dad to put me in an inpatient mental facility because I swore I had lost my mind. Nobody thinks like me. Nobody feels like me. Nobody acts like me. Nobody drinks like me. Like something is so wrong and I need some kind of help. And my grandmother said, he's at a meeting. I said, he's at a meeting? What kind of meeting is he at? 
Who's listening to him? <laughs> she said, oh, I don't know. It's at the Avenue in Fernon, and he has to get this paper signed. <laughs> but he forgot it. Do you want to bring it to him? And I sat at my grandmother's for a minute, and within that minute, it felt like a lifetime. And I thought, if I wait here for my dad, and he comes in this door, I'm going to ask him for a couple hundred dollars like I always do, and I am going to just go right back to where I was, and I can't do it one more minute. And I got so scared, I jumped up, and I startled my grandmother, and I said, give me the paper, where'd you say it was? She said, the Avenue in Fernon. And I went down, and there was a there was a building, 1605 East Moimensing Avenue, which is the South Philadelphia Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I walked up to the door, and I didn't know it was an AA meeting, and I didn't know what kind of meeting he was at or what he was doing. I told you I was bright, right? So I needed to get let in, and so, so I knocked on the door, and, and a guy answered the door. And he looked at me, and he looked at me up and down. I did not look like I was coming to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. I clean up pretty well, though, don't I? <laughs> Woo! So I got to tell you, I had ripped up jeans and a Megadeth t-shirt, cut down to no man's land, big black hair and a purple stripe, and I had more makeup on. You would have needed a jackhammer to get that off. <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, what do you want? And I said, I'm looking for my dad. He said, who's your dad? I said, Chris Package. He said, I don't know him, but there's a lot of people. Do you want to come in? And I said, yeah. And as God would have it, the door opened and I could see my dad right down the way. And I looked and he looked and he dropped his head. <laughs> and he looked me up and down and he went, oh, come here. And I walked back and somebody got up and I sat down and I said, Dad. And he said, shh, don't talk to me during the meeting. And I said, why did I come here? I hate him. He never listens to me, my God. Two minutes later I went, but Dad. And he said, Kim, don't talk during the meeting. And God, through people, Inadvertently, he saved my life. God used him, my father. And I believe that his act of amends started before that. But when I look back on it now in my heart, how I feel, like it was on fire from that moment on. And I heard something and I thought, I felt like that. And I heard something and I thought, yeah, yeah, I'm like that. I did that. Then I heard something else and I thought, wow. You're crazy. <laughs> and you're sharing that on group level? I had to look up and see who this person was. And as I looked and people were talking, you were all laughing. You were laughing and you were smiling and I knew it was genuine. And I knew that your eyes were bright and your cheeks were rosy. And you had something that I wanted so desperately for so long. And you had a cup of coffee in this hand and a cigarette in this one. <laughs> and I knew I was home. <laughs> Woo! I'm telling you that I trudged that road and I did not take my own life through the grace of Almighty God and He saw fit to keep me alive until He dropped me right off at Alcoholics Anonymous on January 23rd, 1994. And He has helped me through good people like Claire Keller, Scott, Dave, Chris, Dawny, all of the people I have met along the way. He has helped me to lay hold of some principles and get knee deep involved in a spiritual program of action that has caused me to be more than inwardly reorganized.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.